over 65 years on the throne. Yet hers is a reign that nearly didn't happen. I think if for Princess Elizabeth, the abdication must have been catastrophic. Driven by duty. My whole life shall be devoted to your service. She's ruled over crisis and war. Our thoughts today are with those in the South Atlantic. And dramatic social and technological change. Television has made it possible for many of you to see me in your homes on Christmas Day. She's seen over 12 prime ministers come and go. The Queen has a very sharp mind. She's endured the breakup of the empire and the creation of her beloved Commonwealth. The Queen had an instinct of what the new Commonwealth was about. Throughout it all, she's been a steadying presence. Yet the most famous woman in the world remains mysterious. This is the inside story, as told by her closest friends and advisors. I think the Queen is basically a very shy person. She's very humble, actually. She's a wonderful mimic. I mean, she's really, really funny. It's hard to imagine a world without her. She has done her job bloody well. Elizabeth, the wife, the mother, the Queen. Princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary was born on the 21st of April 1926 in the middle of a political crisis. The Home Secretary of the time was busy dealing with the threat of a general strike when he received an urgent summons. The birth of all royal babies had to be assented by a high level of cabinet, preferably the Home Secretary, and that meant he had to leave the general strike and go and basically sit in the next room while the Duchess gave birth to her little girl. Elizabeth Windsor and her younger sister Margaret Rose grew up with their parents, the Duke and Duchess of York, in their home at 145 Piccadilly, a mile from Buckingham Palace, never dreaming the palace would one day become their home. They called themselves we four, us four, and they were never happier than when together. Because her father was second in line to the throne, he actually didn't have that much work. So she saw a huge amount of her parents. And this is very rare for children in the 1920s and 30s of the upper classes. This happy protected family life wasn't designed to prepare Elizabeth for the distant possibility of ascending the throne. Her limited education was typical for an upper class girl of the time. They had private tutors. There was really terribly little contact with children your own age, apart from her sister and one or two royal or semi-royal sort of cousins, you know. They didn't get out in the rough and tumble of, of childhood. The education that they got was also limited. I think it would have been much better if they had gone off to school like everybody else. Not only did the young princess receive little education, she was also shy. Lady Penn, a lady-in-waiting to the Queen Mother, has been a close friend of the Queen for most of her life. In a rare interview, she reveals how Elizabeth's mother tried to boost her confidence. The Queen Mother told the Queen when she was very young to be brave. I think the Queen probably, when she was young, felt Walking into a room full of people was rather daunting. And she said to her, well, what you want to do when you walk into a room, walk through the middle of the door. And I think by that she meant, don't sort of go in apologetically. You walk through as if, you know, I'm in charge. <laughs> and I think that was very good advice. Then, on the 10th of December, 1936, one of the most significant days in British history, everything changed. It began, like any other typical day for 10-year-old Elizabeth, with one of her favorite pastimes, a swimming lesson. Lady Butter was a close childhood friend and often went swimming with the young Elizabeth. A whole lot of us went to learn to swim. The Queen and one or two others. I don't think I was very good at it, but the Queen certainly dived extremely well. We had to life save each other. 
We had to pick towels up off the bottom of the pool. Certainly a lot of them were much better than I was. I think the Queen was extremely good, actually. After her swimming lesson, Elizabeth went home. Elizabeth was getting ready to write up her notes from her swimming lesson. And then she heard these sounds from outside, these great sounds of God save the King. And she went to a footman and said, why is this? What's happening? By an instrument of abdication, dated... And the footman said, your uncle has abdicated and your father is king. God save the king. And Elizabeth was rather surprised. She was only 10. And she went to her sister, Margaret, and said, um, Margaret, uncle has abdicated and father is king. And Margaret said, well, does that mean you're going to be queen now? And Elizabeth said, yes. And Margaret said, well, poor you. But Elizabeth, she was so unflappable. She was so calm. She sat down and she wrote up her swimming notes as she planned to do, but at the top she wrote abdication day. And that to me is the key to Elizabeth's character. It's a rather overused phrase, but she's the epitome of keep calm and carry on. King Edward VIII had abdicated after falling in love with a twice married American divorcee. Political pressure forced him to choose between the crown and the woman he loved. I remember being told that there was going to be a broadcast at night and I was in bed and I had a little wireless. I turned it on, I lay there and I heard what he had to say. I have found it impossible to discharge my duties as king without the help and support of the woman I love. And I honestly thought it was the end of the world. I thought, we haven't got a king, what's going to happen? And that, I can remember feeling that. The last thing she wanted was to be queen. She did not want her father, who was a sick man, to bear the awful burden of being monarch. And I would think that she saw the abdication as being, from the point of view of her family, an unmitigated disaster. She was 10 years old, shy, and hadn't received the best of educations. But now, she would one day be queen. A 41-gun salute is fired in Hyde Park by 30-pounders, and the new reign is begun. When the abdication was announced, Elizabeth was catapulted into a new life. The relaxed lifestyle of we four was shattered. Their governess, Marion Crawford, tried to help the young princesses to adjust to the changes overwhelming the family. Nigel Astle, became a close friend of the woman they called Crawfy. Crawfy spent a, a lot of time talking to them about this change and trying to allay their fears, but at the same time saying, well, things have to be different. And you do realize that now when your father comes home, you will have to curtsy to him because he is king. And so when King George came home and his two daughters curtsied to him, he was thoroughly taken aback because suddenly there were these two girls being very formal and he just didn't know what to do, but eventually just swept them up and gave them both cuddles and they realised in fact that their father hadn't changed. When they moved to Buckingham Palace, it was not what any of them expected. A lot of people think that these are fantastic places. They are luxurious, they um, you know, exude comfort, but it is not like that. I think Crawfee explained it when she said it's rather like camping in a museum. But the 10-year-old princess was able to join the girl guides and learn leadership skills early on. A lot of girls were asked to become members of the first Buckingham Palace Girl Guide Company, and I happened to be a lucky one. And so we got our uniforms, which was very exciting. And then we were divided into patrols. And I think I'm right, the Queen's was the Kingfisher, and I, I was certainly the Robin Patrol. 
I think she was her patrol leader too, so she had the responsibility for her patrol. We had to learn the promise, and we had to learn to tie knots, and we had to learn to signal Morse code. That was fun. Great, great fun. Even age 10, she had a serious approach to life. Margaret Rose's best friend since childhood, Lady Glen Connor, recalls Elizabeth could be disapproving of her younger sister. Princess Margaret was always such fun. She was always thinking of sort of naughty things to do. Uh, I mean, we used to hide behind doors, and then when some uh, wretched page came along with a tray, we'd jump out and say boo. Which we, and and uh, the Queen used to say, you can't do that. That's very naughty. <laughs> She was more serious, the Queen, than Princess Margaret. The Princess's governess, Marion Crawford, noticed that even as a young girl, Elizabeth possessed an almost frightening attention to detail, which she would apply throughout her life. Crawford talked about the fact that the uh, two little princesses were very different. Uh, on the one hand, Elizabeth, very methodical, sometimes quite obsessive about how she arranged her bedroom, how she arranged her clothes or whatever, whereas Margaret was very, very different. And it just showed yet again that here we have quite a normal family, just now thrust into the very royal limelight. Elizabeth had a strong, serious character, but she did not have the training to mold it for the task ahead. It was her grandmother, Queen Mary, who insisted Elizabeth should get a more serious education to prepare her for her coming role. I remember being asked to a children's party at Buckingham Palace and seeing this very, very, very tall, absolutely straight, ramrod straight lady. She always seemed sort of terribly unbending, as I think she was. It was Queen Mary's idea that Elizabeth should attend Eton College to study with Henry Martin. I was actually taught at one moment, I think, by Henry Martin. He was very grand. He was what was called Vice Provost. And um, he was pretty old, with a, a fringe of white hair, rather small, uh, hobbled a little bit, but very, very beautiful, careful enunciation of every word. It was a rather old-fashioned sort of English. Elizabeth learnt so much from Henry Martin, history, constitution, politics, the way in which one governs, but he had two main messages that he gave to her and she's treasured throughout her reign. Number one was the importance of political neutrality. Sir Henry Martin was very, very sure that the monarch should be politically neutral, should stay out of disputes and remain above them. And of course, Elizabeth has been politically neutral throughout her reign, par excellence. The other great message that Henry Martin gave to Elizabeth was that of broadcasting. He said the most important thing you can do is get your voice out there, get your voice to the people, to those of empire, to those of Britain. And that has been something she has deployed brilliantly. In future years, she drew on these lessons. Throughout her reign, she refused to be dragged into party politics and used first the radio and then television to broadcast to her people. On the 3rd of September, 1939, Britain declared war on Germany. The King and Queen chose to remain in London, sharing the risks of the capital during wartime. The latest outrage of the Nazis' indiscriminate fury is the bombing of Buckingham Palace. The royal family became icons of the nation as Britain came under attack. I think the King and Queen were fantastic examples. They got a bomb outside Buckingham Palace and the Queen said she felt much better because they had exactly what everybody else had had. But the young princesses had their own role to play in supporting the war effort. Initially, there was secrecy about the whereabouts of Elizabeth and Margaret. Later, it was revealed that they were in Windsor Castle. For Margaret, 
It was an isolated existence. We packed for the weekend and stayed for five years. They put up some rather feeble barbed wire. Of course, wouldn't have kept anybody out, but it kept us in. Within a year, 14-year-old Princess Elizabeth had the opportunity to put the lessons she had learned from Henry Martin at Eton to good use. In 1940, she made her first ever radio broadcast in support of the war effort when she addressed evacuated children. The British hoped America would enter the war, where the broadcast was also heard. All of us children who are still at home think continually of our friends and relations who have gone overseas who have traveled thousands of miles to find a wartime home and a kindly welcome in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States of America. My sister is by my side, and we are both going to say good night to you. Come on, Margaret. Good night, children. Good night, and good luck to you all. The broadcast had a huge effect on the British nation, but particularly it had a massive effect on America. Elizabeth is just a teenager herself giving out this very sympathetic, empathetic message to the evacuated children. But the political ramifications of this are huge and they do actually affect great political movements, America into the war. And that's the beginning of her realization of how important her words can be. The princess had done her duty and made her first broadcast. She understood the power of the new technology, but for the rest of her life, she would battle with it. As the war continued, the dutiful young princess lived on wartime rations like the rest of the country. Although their meals were supplemented by food from the royal estates, frugality was second nature to Elizabeth. She had a Scottish mother and had grown up surrounded by canny Highland women. All of us who were brought up in the war were frugal. We had to be. The food was rationed and they had the same rationing as everybody else. And the clothes were rationed. So, you know, it was, it was a part of life to be frugal. And I think it's very Scottish too. And the Queen is Scottish. She is a frugal person, absolutely. I think that you say, if it is a Scot, you're canny. You look after your money. Don't throw it about. I don't think she's a materialistic person at all. Personally, I really don't. She's more really inclined to turn off lights. If she thinks they shouldn't be being wasting electricity because um, people are rather inclined to leave them on. That sort of thing. Princess Elizabeth had until now followed the path laid down by the court and her parents. But on one of the most important decisions of her life, the man she would marry, she would rebel against her parents and follow her own judgment. In 1939, a dashing young cadet arrived at the Royal Naval College, Dartmouth. He made a strong impression on Michael Vaughan. We saw this group of older cadets, usually at the double, so they attracted our attention and we soon became aware that a, an outstanding figure amongst them was a tall, blonde-haired chap who we soon learned was a prince and that was quite exciting to have a prince at the college. He was Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark. Philip was a grandson of the King of Greece. He'd had a royal childhood, but it had been neither conventional nor stable. His four sisters all married German aristocrats. Three of their husbands were members of the Nazi party. His father was a playboy in the south of France, and his mother was confined to an asylum in Switzerland. Well, it's always difficult to know what affects other people, but I suppose that when you're in a situation you, you know you have to deal with it. And he obviously loved his sisters and he saw a lot of them and he had cousins. And then I think he was happy with all of us. And I think 
he always used to say, well, I haven't known anything else. So, you know, I am where I am, and I mean, let's get on with it, frankly. That is him. That summer of 1939, the king, queen, and 13-year-old Princess Elizabeth arrived at Dartmouth in the royal yacht. It was a visit that would change her life. On their official visit to the Royal Naval College Dartmouth in 1939, Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret planted trees, and a cadet was assigned to look after them. When the King and the Queen took her to Dartmouth, Prince Philip was designated to sort of look after her a bit and show her around. On the last night there, they gave a dinner party for a group of senior cadets. I should think probably 20 of them. And Prince Philip, of course, was one of those. A photographer happened to capture this significant meeting in a snapshot. There was tremendous excitement among the cadets as the royal yacht steamed away from Dartmouth at the end of the visit. As the Victoria and Albert prepared to leave harbour, we'd all been told to get into these boats. And we all uh, rode downstream and followed in the wake of the VNA until she cleared the harbour. And then off she went because we couldn't row as fast as she could steam. But one cadet didn't stop rowing. Prince Philip of Greece put on a burst of speed and pulled ahead of the other rowers. When they left, he got in a little boat and rowed out to sort of wave goodbye which was quite a prank, and I should imagine rather frowned upon by the authorities. But that, I think, would have impressed her, and she would have thought enormous fun. And I think she must have seen something then, actually. The rumours then started. Everyone said, oh, yes, they, they uh, fell in love, um, and they're writing to each other. Well, I'm not quite sure how it's firm the... Um, intelligence was about these things, but that's what we all thought. The intelligence was right. In this rarely seen letter, written on the eve of her wedding, Princess Elizabeth described how Philip captured her attention. The first time I remember meeting Philip was at the Royal Naval College Dartmouth. Then he went to the Pacific and Far East for two years. But her mother had in mind a much more traditional royal suitor. At Windsor Castle, in the midst of wartime England, Elizabeth and Margaret were surrounded by grenadier guards. The young guards officers who were on duty at the castle became friends, and so they saw a lot of them. The young officers garrisoned there were some of the most aristocratic soldiers of their generation, and the most eligible. The King and Queen invited a few to meet Princess Elizabeth. I think that the, the Queen Mother's hope for Princess Elizabeth was very much that she would marry a grenadier guard. That was sort of the ideal. And there were, of course, various candidates. The Queen Mother encouraged Elizabeth to make a conventional British aristocratic match. So a few wartime balls were organised in the castle. They did have a party occasionally, a ball, which we were lucky enough to be invited to. And if you didn't live there, you, you stayed. And then the, um, I think it must have been the Blues and Royals were stationed and the Brigade of Gods in Windsor. So there were lots of young men available and delighted to have an evening out. I do remember the fun of the dancing and the boys and everything. They had a band, and the whole thing was just wonderful. I mean, you were taken out of the horror of the war. It was a marvellous 24 hours. Not only did none of these young aristocrats catch Elizabeth's eye, she was also about to stand up to her parents again. She wanted to play her part in the war effort, but her father had reservations. Finally, Elizabeth was permitted to join the ATS, 
the women's branch of the British Army, to train as an ambulance driver. The princess, who was on the eve of her 19th birthday when these pictures were taken, is at the wheel of a 1500 weight truck in convoy. Although she drives it with apparent composure, she had no experience of driving before she commenced her training. Her image as an ambulance driver played a potent part in wartime propaganda and was considered a huge success. Her persistence had paid off. The German war is therefore at an end. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. Approaches to Buckingham Palace were almost continually jammed. It was the end of nearly six years of war in Europe. No wonder people went a bit crazy. In the aftermath of war, Elizabeth's determination to follow her own path grew even stronger. She continued to defy her parents and the court by becoming more committed to Prince Philip. The relationship wasn't exactly welcomed in royal circles. I'm afraid the courtiers, and by that I really mean the Queen Mother's close friends, they were pretty hostile to him. He wasn't something they could quite sort of put their finger on. He had a lot of German relations. Uh, that wasn't particularly fashionable at that time, obviously. He was also absolutely penniless. So, you know, there were many things sort of going against him. He was very outspoken. They'd call him brash. And what was he going to say? And this, that, and the other. I think, let's face it, every parent's very protective of their daughters. So they must have looked at every possible angle that might be a threat. The king and queen would have wanted her to be sure that she was making the right choice. And in a way, I've always thought that by marrying Prince Philip, that was the one time when the queen stepped sort of right out of the normal sort of uh, pla plans for her and did something really rather unconventional. Elizabeth had made up her own mind. She got engaged to Philip, but King George asked his daughter to keep her engagement secret until after they had completed their first major overseas tour. February 1947, HMS Vanguard transported the royal family across the equator to South Africa. On the way, Elizabeth had time to relax, but now she also had to apply herself to her royal role. And she would do this with the duty and foresight which would become defining characteristics of her entire reign. Pretty well everyone in Cape Town must have been there to welcome the royal visitors, lining the streets, watching from windows and balconies, waving and cheering. The climax of the tour was Elizabeth's 21st birthday, and it was her own idea to mark it with a radio broadcast. The lessons learned with Henry Martin at Eton were now helping to prepare her for her future role as Queen and Head of the Commonwealth. Sir Sonny Ramphill worked closely with the Queen during his 15 years as Secretary General of the Commonwealth. He saw in this speech Elizabeth preparing herself for a new style of leadership. I always felt that Elizabeth came to the throne with a kind of intuitive understanding that she was going to preside over the Commonwealth, that would be different. That would not be her father's Commonwealth. She had gone to Africa as part of her getting to know the Commonwealth she would inherit. So I think Elizabeth had an instinct for the newness of the time to come. As I speak to you today from Cape Town, I am 6,000 miles from the country where I was born. But I am certainly not 6,000 miles from home. That is the great privilege belonging to our place in the worldwide Commonwealth. That there are homes ready to welcome us in every continent of the earth. What's particularly striking about the speech is its extraordinary combination of ancient traditions and modernity. It is a direct appeal to 
the youth the future. But then she speaks also to the king's subjects, whomever they may be. And that's a particularly important thing for the Commonwealth going forward as a non-racial organization, a real collective identity. There is a motto which has been borne by many of my ancestors, a noble motto, I serve. Through the inventions of science, I can make my solemn act of dedication with a whole empire listening. I should like to make that dedication now. It is very simple. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. I have shivers going up and down my spine as I think of those words, I serve, when looking back over the long life of the Queen and, and her service, her, the importance that she has attached to duty and her constant support and encouragement of the Commonwealth. She really meant what she said. Back in London in July 1947, Elizabeth and Philip were finally able to make their engagement public. Churchill spoke for many when he said the wedding would be a flash of colour on the road we have to travel. Sir Nicholas Soames remembers how his grandfather welcomed the wedding. It was all rather drab. And then this very beautiful young princess, the heir to the throne, marries a very dashing, very handsome officer in the Royal Navy. And it was a moment of national rejoicing, which was beyond the war. So this was, in a way, I think my grandfather thought, the beginning of a new era. The royal wedding took place at Westminster Abbey. At the time, David Weirt was a 12-year-old chorister. For the first time, certainly since I'd been involved in the, in the Abbey, we'd seen all the lights on. And not only all the usual lights of the Abbey, apparently, but also floodlights that were brought in for the occasion. I mean, the impact on us was one of wow, simply because we were just not used to seeing anywhere lit up in that way uh, or uh, being used for such a, such a happy occasion. The choristers had been placed high up in the organ loft and David craned his neck to get a glimpse of the couple after they signed the register. Judging by the expression that we could just about see when they left St. Edward's Chapel and came down the, into, the, into the sanctuary and then started their procession at, uh, at the end, they were very happy about it all. Certainly some big broad smiles, not just to their friends either. It seemed to be everybody included. Lady Butter was inside the Abbey as an old friend of the royal couple. Then she hurried to Buckingham Palace to enjoy being part of the crowd. Thousands of people by then, all singing and shouting. But it was a long, long wait because they were obviously having their wedding breakfast. And I remember, and I don't know why, there was a puff of smoke went up suddenly having waited very patiently and everybody chatting to everybody. And there's one Cockney lady standing next to me said, look at that, she said, that's it, they're having their afters. So we thought, well, that's good because they won't be long now, now coming out. And how they cheered the happy pair when they came out onto the balcony. What a wonderful picture the princess made, looking most lovely in her magnificent gown and standing happily beside her husband. Lucky her, I think we thought, and lucky all of us, frankly. Because, you know, it, it, was like, it was a really good fairy tale, and it's remained a good fairy tale, too. But the domestic idyll of married life would be all too brief for the newlyweds. Soon, duty would beckon. Elizabeth had spent her early years preparing for her future role as monarch. Yes. She'd learned the importance of duty, but she'd also demonstrated an independent streak. 
when it came to marrying the man she loved. With her handsome husband by her side, she could concentrate on enjoying married life. They set off for Malta. Prince Philip was stationed there as a naval officer and had command of his own ship. In Malta, Elizabeth could put thoughts of becoming queen to the back of her mind. Martin Shikluna was a teenager in Malta in 1949 when Elizabeth became a close friend of his grandfather. His name was Sir Hannibal Publius Shikluna, a rather grand name, but he was a historian, he was a knight of Malta, and when uh, Princess Elizabeth came out to Malta in 1949, he was asked to be her, her mentor. I have a picture which shows a great affection um, in the look of the Queen's eyes and in my grandfather's eyes as they met. She lived at a wonderful place called Villa Guardamanja. Sadly, a place which has fallen into some decay since then. But she was there in a married quarter. It was an ordinary naval officer's married quarter. She was relaxed. She was away from the spotlight. She was able really to be free, possibly for the first and only time in her life. She very much entered into the life of an ordinary naval officer's wife. So she would go to um, beaches to swim. She would go to the Phoenicia, famously to the Phoenicia Hotel, where they would dance. Filming was permitted during the course of the evening, giving this brief impression of an eightsome reel in which the royal couple took part. The Maltese are very good at not intruding on people, uh, particularly people who are famous by definition and giving them space to be themselves. And I suspect it was probably the only time she was able to do that. But for Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip, the idyll in Malta drew to an end. In 1948, their first child, Prince Charles, had been born, followed by Princess Anne two years later. But there was growing concern in London over the health of King George. As his condition deteriorated, Elizabeth was compelled to undertake an increasing number of royal duties. The king had been due to go on a tour of the empire in 1952, but illness meant that Elizabeth and Philip went instead. Their first stop was Kenya, and Elizabeth's private secretary carried in his briefcase the accession documents for the princess just in case. Five days into the tour, King George VI died. In London, Prime Minister Churchill's private secretary, Jock Colville, had to break the news to him. Jock Colville goes upstairs to tell my grandfather that the king has died. And my grandfather is in floods of tears sitting up in bed, very emotional, and, say, and said to, to Jock Colville, Jock, imagine something happening that's the worst thing in the whole world. And Jock Colville thought that perhaps one of my grandfather's own children had died, my both Randolph had died, uh, my uncle Randolph Churchill. And he said, but Prime Minister, the king has died. He said, I know, it's the worst thing that's ever happened in my life. London tried to get word to the British governor in Nairobi, but they couldn't get hold of him. The press found out first. John Jockimson was a Fleet Street photographer covering the royal visit. I saw the chap from the East African Standard on the phone to his office saying, well, I can't believe it. And I stopped and I thought, hello, what's happened? And then he said something about that the king had died and this is the first they knew about it. Jockinson overheard a journalist telling Elizabeth's private secretary about the king's death. So he dashed to the lodge at Sagana, where the royal party was staying. 
but by the time he got there, the news had been passed to Prince Philip. Look, shattering, because there they were in Kenya, perfectly normal married couple, having a very happy life. And overnight, I mean, to be told this, and for uh, Philip to have to break the news to the Queen. We were standing outside the Royal Lodge uh, with our cameras in our hands, and somebody came out and said, Her Majesty requests that no pictures be taken. So we, three of us put our cameras on the deck, you know, on the, in the dirt. And we said, no, well, we're going to stay here and see her as she comes out. And about five minutes after, she came out in the cars quite slowly. I remember her looking so sad. And she just raised her arm, much to say thank you for not taking the picture. I shall never forget she came back dressed in black coming down the steps of the aircraft and realizing, well, that was it. Everything had changed. And being met at the bottom of the steps as queen. At the foot of the steps stood her prime minister, Winston Churchill. He saw in this young woman a monarch he could guide. I think that my grandfather saw and realized in the new queen that this was the new Elizabethan era and that it was a modern era and an era full of hope and promise. And he loved her. I mean, he did love the queen. There's no doubt he absolutely adored her. In 1952, Princess Elizabeth became the youngest monarch to ascend the throne for over a hundred years. Her accession was shocking and unexpected. Called to be queen, sovereign head of a great commonwealth of nations at the early age of 25. In the 1950s, the country was emerging from the drab post-war era. During her first decade on the throne, the Queen would make use of her glamour and youth to shape the monarchy. The spectacle of a young Queen performing these tasks with so much poise and elegance soon made it fashionable to talk of a new Elizabethan age. But there would be great challenges ahead. She needed to learn how to deal with politicians as a constitutional monarch. And when her sister fell in love with a married man, she had to navigate the conflict between duty and family. Privately, she wanted Princess Margaret to be happy, and publicly, she couldn't grant that happiness. June 1953 saw the coronation of a beautiful young queen and the head of the British Empire, the largest empire on Earth. A new technology, television, wanted to bring the ceremony into every home in the country. But television was an intimate medium, and the queen struggled with it. She feared that television would sully a deeply religious ceremony. The Queen's close friend, Prue Lady Penn, remembers how much it worried her. Television was very new, and I think it worried people that it was going to be an intrusion on a very um, solemn and sacred moment in, in her life. The Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, shared the Queen's concern. He'd never been a fan of the new medium. It is no secret that my grandfather's view was that it was improper for the nation to ogle this moment over their coffee cups, and that in some way detracted from the dignity of the ceremony. Initially, the Queen insisted that TV cameras should not cover the sacred central part of the coronation ceremony. She was happy with the procession coming down the aisle, anything being filled up to the rood screen. But inside that special part of the abbey, she thought that should be private. She didn't like the idea of it. And Churchill responded to her concerns 
and backed her all the way. When it was announced that television would have only limited coverage and the public would not see the moment of the crowning, there was a huge reaction. The newspapers of every persuasion, from the Mirror to the Times, uh, that very day said, no, this is not on. This is, this is a great public national moment. It has to be seen. In response to public pressure, Churchill partially backed down. In this secret record of cabinet discussion, Churchill stated, I am concerned at the public disappointment caused by the announcement that there would be no television of the coronation east of the screen. I am satisfied the decision should be reviewed. However, he was quietly busy imposing other restrictions, including no close-up views of the Queen should be photographed or televised at any stage of the ceremony. BBC broadcaster Peter Dimmock, who had been fighting to televise the coronation, was asked to stage a demonstration in the Abbey to prove there would be no close-ups. But Dimmock had a trick up his sleeve. He deliberately used the wrong lens. My father was quite naughty because when he did the demonstration in the Abbey to the establishment, he used a wide two-inch lens so that when he showed them what it would look like on television, it looked as though it was very far away, the camera. But on the actual day, he didn't use that lens. He used a different lens, uh, which meant he got that fabulous close-up of the Queen, which was so successful, and everybody loved it. In the end, the Queen compromised and let the whole ceremony be televised with the exception of one moment, the most sacred of all, when she was anointed with holy oil. On Coronation Day, two of the Queen's maids of honor, Lady Jane Rain Lacey and Lady Glen Connor, remember the moment she arrived at Westminster Abbey. Four of us went to the Abbey to receive her. We were standing by the door waiting and then suddenly we realized she was coming because we could hear this roar and it got louder and louder and louder. And around the corner came this golden coach. It was like a fairy tale. And then the queen, I mean, looked fantastic. We hadn't seen her in her dress, this beautiful dress and this sort of tiny waist and wonderful complexion. I mean, she just looked dazzling. And then she just turned around and she said, ready, girls. <laughs> Off we went. <laughs> ready, girls. Ready, girls. We were as ready as we ever could be. <laughs> Little did the 27-year-old realise she would become Britain's longest reigning monarch. On the 2nd of June, 1953, the young monarch Elizabeth II walked down the aisle towards her coronation. For the Queen, this ritual was not about taking power. For her, it was a moment of spiritual transformation. The great thing about her was she was so calm. And I think that's what made us feel, you know, everything was going to be all right. For the viewers at home, the high point of the ceremony was when the Queen was crowned. The Queen had compromised and allowed this moment to be broadcast. Before she received the crown, she was handed the orb and scepter. They weren't just symbols of worldly power. They had a sacred significance too. The Archbishop of York, John Sentamu, who was preached before the Queen, explains. She's given the orb, which is made up of about 600 jewels uh, and pearls, and on top, a cross, saying Christ is Lord of the whole earth. And then she's given a scepter with a big diamond uh, in the middle, and again on the top has got a cross. The scepter is telling her, Queen, your power comes not from parliament or inherited from your father, but from God. But the Queen's deep faith meant that the holiest moment of all was not televised. The Queen insisted the cameras did not show the sacred anointing with holy oil. 
head is anointed for wisdom. The chest, which is where the heart is, is anointed for mercy, for kindness, and then the hands are anointed for service. To prepare the queen for the holy moment, her elaborate robes were taken off and she was dressed in a simple white shift. It brought a lump to my throat, but she looked like a very young girl, younger than 26, I think she was. She looked yeah. like 18 and yeah. so vulnerable and defenseless in a way, just sitting there. And we were able to see it because we were just there and very few people did. I remember feeling quite choked by it. I'd never seen her look like that before. She'd always been very dressed up when I'd seen her in beautiful dresses. And here she was with nothing. For Lady Glen Connor, it was nearly too much. It was while the Queen was being anointed that I thought I was going to faint. Luckily, Jane could feel me sort of swaying, and Black Rod, who was just by me, realised and pinioned me to the pillow with his arm, and uh, it just gave me uh, that much support. For the Queen, the coronation had transformed her into a servant of God. But when she returned to Buckingham Palace, the Queen was reminded that she was also a mother and a monarch. When we got back to the palace, the Queen walked in, lifted off the crown with a sigh of relief. I think she said it was giving oh, me very, a headache. Very heavy. Yes. And she put it down on this little side table and somebody came forward and gave her a cup of tea. We were all having tea and sandwiches. And then Prince Charles came running in and he made a beeline for the crown. And I was not that near, but near enough I could have made a lunch for it. But somebody, I think it was Prue Penn, rushed towards him and got it just in time. You could see his little podgy hands <laughs> were sort of getting ready to try it on for size. At the end of the long day, the Queen had promised to serve her people. Now she stepped onto the balcony to enjoy their acclaim. What was so wonderful was everywhere the Queen went, we had to go too. We had this wonderful view of everything. Yes. We were in the front row next to I know. It was the sort of roar of love. You could feel it, couldn't you? Coming at you. It was more or less something that sort of hit you. You can't imagine what it was like. This blaze of colour and pageantry mm -hmm. and a beautiful young queen. Well, of course, it was a beautiful young queen, all right, because nothing else, I'm afraid, will ever come near it. No. A uh, middle-aged man it isn't quite the same thing, is it, Jane? Yeah. <laughs> Two years after the pageantry and reverence of the coronation, another event showed the Queen's intense Christian faith when the exciting American evangelist Billy Graham arrived to tour Britain. We believe that he died. We believe that he rose again. But that's not enough to make you a Christian. That's an intellectual faith. There must be the receiving, that act of trusting and commitment to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Master and Savior. Have you done that? If you haven't... Two of the Queen's coronation maids of honor went in person to hear Billy Graham preach. Then you are not saved. He really sort of touched a chord. You must receive Christ. Receive and with Christ. such passion and... and conviction. I mean, and I've never heard a sermon that no, really made he... me jump out of my seat. All of us believe in God. And I, I really felt the presence of God. I mean, I felt that he really was sent from God, actually. These scenes of religious fervor were shown on television. The Queen watched, and a few days later, she invited Billy Graham to Windsor Castle. He went to Windsor to preach, actually, in the chapel in the Great Park, which is like the private parish church of the royal family, and was invited to lunch afterwards. And he found a young English sovereign who was remarkably versed in the ways of the Bible, who loved discussing uh, the evangelical precepts by which he stood. Jesus was the son of God sent to earth to save us. Christ is the center of our living, is the center of our thinking, the center of our planning, and the center real of our goal in life because she knows in the end, ultimately, she'll be answerable, not humanity. 
but to God. The coronation had not only been a triumph for the Queen, it had also been an opportunity for her Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, to stay on in office. Churchill may have been a giant of the 20th century, but by the time the Queen ascended the throne, he was 77 and in poor health. Churchill cunningly used the young Queen to prolong his time in Downing Street. The accession of the Queen gave Churchill the wonderful excuse he needed to assume the role of mentor to this new young sovereign. Publicly, Churchill flattered the Queen. We have found out a very good plan. <laughs> the Queen can do no wrong. Here is monarchy actually being used in politics. Churchill saying, look, I've got to help this young lady. No stepping aside for me. And by postponing the date of the coronation, effectively for a year, uh, with the coronation always being held in the summer. It could have been held in the summer of 52 with a bit of dispatch. But he said, no, we've got to do it in 53. Thus really guaranteeing himself the best part of 18 months more in the job. Soon after the coronation, Churchill suffered a serious stroke. For several days, neither the Queen nor the nation was told. The Queen learnt that her Prime Minister had been close to death, but it was hard for a monarch in her mid-twenties with limited education to confront a grand old man and encourage him to step down. Churchill had served six of the kings and queens of England. So the Queen had, um, I imagine, tremendous respect and I assume a sort of reverence for my grandfather. But equally, she had a constitutional responsibility and I think it must have been very, very, very difficult for her. Not wanting to upset my grandfather, equally, he was clearly incapacitated. Churchill recovered enough to insist he would stay on as Prime Minister. Not only was Churchill old, he was also determined to maintain the British Empire. But the young Queen wanted to transform the old empire into the modern Commonwealth, a free association of independent countries. It had been founded in 1949 during her father's reign, but Elizabeth was committed to expanding the Commonwealth. In the autumn of 1953, the Queen and Prince Philip set off on a round-the-world tour of 12 countries. That would encourage the transition from the Empire into the Commonwealth. I think that tour in the early 50s did mark the evolution of the modern Commonwealth. You could have all the declarations you wanted, but unless they were translated into human action and interaction of, of the Queen. It couldn't be a commonwealth on parchment. It had to be a commonwealth of the flesh. The longest visit on this tour was the two months the Queen spent in Australia, when she became the first British monarch to visit the country. When she arrived at the dock in Sydney, the huge crowd included future leaders of Australia. I remember the first day along with everybody else, we went down to Farm Cove. Didn't get very close, but we were caught up in the, the celebratory character of it. That was a great day for those of us who had the luck or foresight to be in Sydney. But Anna was a beautiful Sydney day, and there's no city in the world that can turn on a, a welcome with a harbour quite like Sydney. It was an extraordinary tour. She met something like six to seven million Australians out of a population of nine million. It really was a combination of Grace Kelly meets the current Duchess of Cambridge in terms of popularity. Uh, a real interest and affection for the Queen. Melbourne, where the Queen and His Royal Highness were given one of the most tumultuous welcomes of the whole tour. Nearly a million people, many of whom had been waiting 24 hours in the streets, were there to wave and to cheer. The writer Thomas Keneally, then aged 18, was a Republican. He wasn't a fan of the Queen, but he could see her allure. I have no ill will towards the monarchy, but um, I, I wasn't very interested. 
but my little brother and all these schoolmates went to the local oval and lined up and I think that's when Australians learned that the Queen was willing to stand beneath bright skies and warm sun and swallow flies for us. Across the globe, the Queen's tour accelerated the transformation of the empire into an expanded commonwealth. The Queen really was seeing the commonwealth evolving in a very different way, as a collective identity. Modern commonwealth has been the Queen's version of identity politics, crossing all those boundaries and embracing diversity. But the tour wasn't without its problems. The visit to Sri Lanka, then known as Ceylon, would bring the Queen into conflict with her Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. The row was about a planned visit to the most sacred Buddhist temple, said to contain the tooth of the Buddha. Churchill tried to tell her what to do. She was going to go to Kandy and visit the Temple of the Tooth. And indeed, it was extremely important that she did so. And if she didn't visit the Temple of the Tooth, then Ceylon was going to cancel the visit. But when Churchill got to hear about this, he realized she'd have to take her shoes and stockings off. And Churchill thought this was undignified and inappropriate and was dead against this. Finally, an elder statesman was consulted and very sensibly he said, actually, taking your shoes and stockings off uh, in the Temple of the Tooth is no different from taking your hat off in church. The Queen went to the Temple of the Tooth and everybody was perfectly happy. The Queen ignored her Prime Minister and removed her shoes. It always struck me while I was Secretary General that the Queen was always happy in the Commonwealth. In some ways, in Britain, she was a bit dour. But in the Commonwealth, she was laughing. She was involving herself. And when the brew was ready, it was offered in a coconut shell to the Queen. She returned to Britain in May 1954. And within a year, the Queen received the resignation of her first Prime Minister. At the age of 80, Winston Churchill finally left office. The Queen did him the great honor of coming to dinner at 10 Downing Street in his last week. The Queen lifted her glass to my grandfather and she said to my Prime Minister. And my grandfather, without any preparation, he stood up and he said, I propose a health. I used to drink when I was in the four bazaars of Bangalore in India in the reign of your majesty's great, great grandmother, Queen Victoria. And I drink to the wise and kindly way of life of which your majesty is the young and gleaming champion. And my mother told me that there was absolute silence in the room. The Queen had to endure the decline of a great Prime Minister. Next, she had to endure the mistakes of his successor. Radio networks throughout the world relayed Sir Anthony Eden's broadcast on Suez. Likely to inflame the whole Middle East with all... The Anthony Eden had been waiting for years to become Prime Minister. Then he rashly took Britain into conflict with Egypt over the Suez Canal had been ashore for some hours and were engaged in dealing with pockets of resistance. Eden lasted less than two years as Prime Minister. When an issue like the Suez crisis comes along, the Queen is obviously extremely well informed by a great number of people and may have very strong views about it, but uh, one of her great skills is, as a constitutional monarch, to be above politics and therefore she must keep out of the day-to-day -day drama of the affair. When it came to her prime ministers, the queen was learning the limits of her political power. But could she use her youth and glamour to reshape the monarchy? In the 1950s, London was coming back to life after years of austerity. 
The Queen was at the centre of a glamorous world of show business and British fashion. Her Majesty, talking with Miss Munro, remarks that they were neighbours at Windsor. She may have been Queen, but she and Prince Philip were able to throw themselves into the colourful world of London nightlife. Her close friend, Prue Penn, remembers. People, I suppose, now see a 91-year-old lady and they forget the fact that she was actually once young. I can remember going with her and Prince Philip to a nightclub in Leicester Square called the 400, which was the smart place to go, where we had drinks and something to eat and danced. She loved to do normal things, like you do when you're young. Clothes were crucial to how the Queen projected her image on the world stage. But initially, she inherited her mother's fashion designer, Norman Hartnell, who designed her wedding dress. Last season, the Queen appeared at a public function in a black and white satin dress that I had designed for her. And within 36 hours, that dress was on sale in all the large stores. The Queen and her sister, Princess Margaret, enjoyed attending fashion shows. The Queen and the Princess, whose own fashions are always a source of great interest and admiration, then took their seats for the parade. Her Majesty is reported to have expressed the keenest pleasure in many of the imaginative ideas shown at this comprehensive parade. At the beginning of the 1950s, the Queen embraced the new look of fashion by employing an up-and-coming young designer, Hardy Amos. The Queen had the most marvelous figure for Hardy to work on. She had the perfect fashion plate figure at the time, a tiny waist. I remember we did have one dress back um, for alteration and pressing at one time, and we couldn't even get a model girl into it. It was so small, um, really small, small waist, but of course a wonderful full bust, which worked wonderfully on all of those 50s evening gowns. The young designer was able to help the Queen project a new, modern image of the monarchy. Lieutenant Colonel Hardy Amis, a special forces commander in the war, burst open the frontiers of post-war fashion. Whereas Hartnell did a lot of fluffy, frilly dresses with a lot of embroideries on them, that was never Hardy's look, and he liked things to be very clean and simple. He always used to say to me, it was one of his stock phrases, was, honour the cloth, honour the cloth. In other words, don't fuss the cloth up, let the cloth speak, and that's what Hardy liked. It was Amos who designed some of the most striking outfits on the Commonwealth tour, including this dress worn in Australia. One of my favourite dresses was the white lace dress that uh, the Queen had in Australia. It was such a chic outfit. It was unusual that it had a very narrow, straight, long skirt showing off her slim hips, the fantastic narrow waist, that wonderful bust, that wonderful little parasol, which was just a very 50s accessory. I always thought she looked in that like a 50s fashion model and not so much like the Queen of England. She really did look amazing. The Queen and her sister both dazzled the world with their youth and glamour. But the Queen was about to discover the potential for conflict in her role as sister and as monarch. She had always been close to Princess Margaret. Princess Margaret told me that she'd had a dream and she dreamt that the Queen had died. And she woke up, she was so horrified by this dream. She said, I got to ring her up. So she went to the telephone and rang her up. And the Queen stood slightly sort of short and said, um, hello, well, how, um, can I help with anything you want? She said, no, it's all right. I just wanted to hear your voice because I had a dream last night that you died. <laughs> And I just wanted to be reassured that you hadn't. And she said, well, it's very sweet of you, but do you mind if I go? I have got a very important visitor here at the moment. <laughs> the spark for the conflict between the two sisters began when they had undertaken their first major foreign tour, accompanying their father, King George VI, to South Africa. Princess Margaret was 16 and spent a lot of time with Peter Townsend, a war hero who served the king. Lady Glenconnor was Princess Margaret's closest friend, and for the first time, she reveals how the romance began. They went in this wonderful train, and they took their horses. And Princess Margaret said every evening and every morning, the train stopped. 
and they went off into this sort of magical South African desert or wherever it was, riding. And I think that was the moment that she first noticed and fell in love with Peter Townsend, who was, in a way, uh, the king's sort of adopted son. I mean, he was a war hero. He was very, very good looking. But he was married and he had children. This relationship would turn into a problem for the Queen. Three years later, another friend spent time with Margaret and Peter Townsend at Balmoral as their romance blossomed. I thought they were in love and the more I saw after seven days, I was convinced of it. When I went back to London, I said to my mother, do you know something? I think Princess Margaret and Townsend are in love. And my mother said, don't be so romantic and ridiculous, Jane. She, he's the king's servant. She couldn't possibly be in love with the king's servant. That would be utterly wrong. In early 1953, Margaret privately requested the queen's permission to marry Townsend. The queen asked Margaret to wait until after the coronation. On coronation day, journalists noticed Princess Margaret's affection towards him. They reported Margaret was in love with a divorcee, Peter Townsend, which posed a serious problem for the Queen as head of the Church of England. I think she um, would have been happy for whatever happened as long as Princess Margaret was happy. That would have been her main thoughts in all of that. I don't think she had any sort of strong feelings about the fact that he'd been married before and he was divorced, and I don't think that came into it. But he was quite a lot older than her. And, of course, he was a divorced person in those days. I mean, divorced people weren't allowed to come to Ascot. It's all so changed now. But it was very difficult for the Queen to know how to respond, really. Now the Queen faced conflict between her affection as a sister and her duty as a monarch. I think the Queen's view is of the romance is very complicated because she was head of the Church of England and so therefore she had to take a certain line. So privately she wanted Princess Margaret to be happy and publicly she couldn't grant that happiness. When Edward VIII fell in love with a divorcee in the 1930s, the affair was initially hushed up. But by the 1950s, the popular press was cheering Margaret on. 96% of Daily Mirror readers wanted her to marry Townsend. The Queen may have wanted her sister to be happy, but the palace acted decisively to get rid of the problem by posting him to a British embassy abroad. Well, in 1953, when it all became public, um, Tommy Lussells, the Queen's private secretary, uh, packed him off to Brussels, got him out of the way. While Townsend was in exile, the newspapers kept running the story. In August 1955, Princess Margaret was in Balmoral for her 25th birthday. Hundreds of journalists camped on her doorstep because on that day, Margaret no longer needed the Queen's permission to marry. Margaret found herself splashed on the front page. When Townsend returned from his banishment, the press hounded him relentlessly. Initially, he stayed with Prue Penn. What he minded most was this press intrusion, which he found terribly hard. They followed him everywhere. Seldom can a man have been so widely discussed without being able to say a word for himself. And I know when he came to our house, he, was, he tried to give them the slip, but he couldn't. And they were around him in motorbikes and cars, and goodness knows what. What the press didn't realize was that the palace plan to scupper the romance had worked. Prue Penn noticed how things had changed. It had been such a sort of rocky road, in fact, that I think it had probably killed something. You know, I think something like that does. By 1955, when he came back, the general public were all saying, well, she's 25 years old now, she can do as she wishes. But I think the romance was over. It had fizzled out. A few weeks later, Margaret made her decision public. The love and affection, sympathy and understanding of the nation and commonwealth 
go out to Princess Margaret in her courageous decision. The end of Princess Margaret's romance with Townsend left a question hanging in the air. Had the Queen's commitment to doing her duty sacrificed the long-term happiness of her sister? Princess Margaret's closest friend remembers the last time the couple met, 40 years after their romance ended. Peter Townsend came to lunch with her and um, she, I said, what was it like seeing him? And she said, well, was charmingly, she said, well, he hadn't changed at all. I mean, he was, you know, and I actually was, because I lived with her at that time, and I looked out of the window and saw him getting out of the car, you know, he was an old man. And yet in her eyes, he hadn't changed. I thought that was very touching. But the conflict between family and duty as monarch would cause even bigger problems in her relationship with her husband. When the young Princess Elizabeth had daringly decided in 1947 to make Philip her husband, she defied her family's expectations. What was left unresolved was whether the royal family took her husband's surname. When the Greek-born Philip became a British citizen, he had taken the name of his uncle, Lord Louis Mountbatten. Mountbatten had been a war hero and the last viceroy of India. When Elizabeth became queen in 1952, Mountbatten had high hopes of renaming the Royal House of Windsor. Mountbatten had very exaggerated ideas of the importance of, as he saw it, the Mountbatten dynasty. Indiscreetly, at dinner at once, he did toast the future of, of, of the House of Mountbatten. He rose at the end of the meal, lifted his glass, and made a toast to the House of Mountbatten, which now reigns. Word of this toast reached Churchill, who disliked Mountbatten's presumption. Lord Louis was a war hero and a very great man, but he and my grandfather were frequently at odds with each other. And I think my grandfather thought it was a bit of a cheat, frankly. Churchill didn't hesitate. He forced the cabinet and the queen to put a stop to Mountbatten's ambition. He had the cabinet agenda for the very next cabinet meeting changed. Cold War, economic crisis, all that could go down the agenda. Right at the top, the name of the royal family. And the cabinet deliberated and had no doubt at all. It had to be the House of Windsor. The cabinet was strongly of the opinion that the family name of Windsor should be retained. And they invited the prime minister to take a suitable opportunity of making their views known to Her Majesty. The battle over the name disturbed Prince Philip. He was upset to be told that he couldn't pass on his name, Mountbatten, to his son. He was a Mountbatten. And um, I suppose it must have struck when Prince Charles was born, because after all, your child is, you wanted to carry your name. I suppose Prince Philip must have assumed that he would have the Mountbatten name. Philip vented his frustration in one pithy sentence. I believe this story that he once bitterly said to somebody, I'm nothing but a bloody amoeba existing to, to procreate. Philip was also unhappy when his wife's job as queen took priority over his naval career. His Royal Highness then went aboard their training cruiser, HMS Devonshire, to present end of cruise prizes. Prince Philip was a very ambitious careerist naval officer. It was for him a bit of disappointment that when he still had at least several years of his career to run and the ball at his feet, so to speak, to suddenly be translated into another world where inevitably, however valuable his role, however important things he did, he was going to play second fiddle. And he did not like being second fiddle. To keep her husband happy, the Queen went out of her way to give him a central role in the royal family. He's an alpha man. He's used to using his talents and he can't pursue his career. So a deal is made. The Queen is going to be the Queen. 
she'll be the monarch. But at home, he is the head of the household and he makes decisions about what happens to the family and particularly what happens to the children and where they go to school. Philip was determined that Charles should go to his old school, Gordonston, famous for encouraging physical toughness. Prince Philip's cousin, Myra Butter, happened to be staying at Balmoral when Charles had his first day at his new school. It was not a happy day. Well, all I can remember is that when Prince Philip came back from taking Charles to school, he looked slightly shaken. And I remember he went straight over. He didn't say anything, but he went straight over and poured himself out a drink. I do remember that, and I thought, oh, that has shaken you. Philip might have accompanied the Queen on her six-month tour of the Commonwealth, but by 1956, he was embarking on his own solo journeys. His wife is suddenly the center of attention. He, of course, famously goes off and tests out the new royal yacht, Britannia. For four months, Prince Philip, accompanied by some close male chums, enjoyed taking the royal yacht to Australia and back and visiting isolated British communities. During this extended trip, the press ran headlines about trouble in the Queen's marriage. It's on this voyage that there are actually reports in the newspapers, not just the American newspapers, suggesting a rift in the royal marriage. And crucially, Buckingham Palace publicly responds and says there is no rift. And that's what made it a really big issue. But in 1960, 10 years after Anne's birth, the Queen was pregnant again. Now comes confirmation of the rumor and the forecast of a happy event early next year. Everybody is delighted with the news. Now she took decisive action to heal any issues with Philip over the surname. She told her Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, that she had set her heart on a change of name for the royal household. The Queen wanted the name of any grandchild without a royal title to be Mountbatten Windsor. Robin Batten, of course, was delighted at the fact that the name Mountbatten was now enshrined uh, in the, the, the heart of the royal family. He would have preferred just plain Mountbatten without any of his Windsor nonsense. But Mountbatten Windsor was a great deal better than just Windsor. The 1950s had been a decade in which Elizabeth had learned to be a queen. She had successfully deployed her youth and glamour to project a modern monarchy. But crucially too, she had discovered the potential for tension between her royal duty and her loyalty to family. Next time, the queen is attacked for being remote and out of touch with her people. The personality conveyed by the utterances which are put into her mouth is that of a priggish schoolgirl. By the end of the decade, the Queen had been persuaded to let the cameras film her family life. I don't think Prince Philip liked it very much. But the Queen was wonderful about it. And the film, of course, had a marvellous response. But would it be enough to win over her people?